So let's start with transportation news, ladies and gentlemen. A week from Wednesday, the Transportation Planning Board at the Council of Governments will consider whether or not to pursue further study of a second crossing of the Potomac River. This is a matter that was raised by a special task force that recommended on July 5th that it be included in the long-range plan for the region. In my judgment, this is a zombie bridge. And we need to put a stake in this. Our county has been opposed to this bridge forever and remains opposed to this bridge. It is a distraction. It promotes sprawl. It degrades the environment. It destroys neighborhoods. And it would totally destroy the Ag Reserve. This will never happen. Congestion is real. Solutions must be real, too. Our council has put before the state for years solutions to the congestion on 270 all the way to the American Legion Bridge and beyond. And we've worked with Fairfax County, making it clear that our priority should be fixing what is broken, not fantasizing about a bridge that will not happen. Clearly, there are people that still want it to happen. Loudoun County still wants it to happen. Montgomery County does not. It is antithetical to our master plan. It is antithetical to what we are trying to create in Montgomery County, and it is antithetical to our transportation priorities. We have scarce transportation dollars. The dollars we do have need to be spent on projects that are real, they need to be spent on things like metro and transit. They do not need to be diverted to something that simply will never happen. Would cost billions if it did and would cost much more damage than just billions of dollars. So I will be introducing a resolution tomorrow that I have here today that calls upon our council to inform TPB of our strong opposition to further study a bridge that is really, it's been studied for so long. I remember when Frank Wolf from Northern Virginia, congressman, who originally thought, oh, we can make this happen, just threw up his hands and said, no, this will never happen. He walked from it. It is time to walk from this. It is time to put this to bed. It is time to focus on things that really do matter. And every day, people sit in that 270 traffic, and I don't blame them for saying, can't you do something? And the answer is, yes, we can do something. And we should do something. But this is not what we should do. So that's transportation item number one on the agenda for tomorrow. Transportation item number two is FAA, we have on the consent calendar tomorrow a positive step forward in protecting our residents from action that was taken by FAA that was ill-advised and many believe unlawful. We are securing for a very nominal fee a legal memorandum from the law firm that is most expert on this matter that has done, it, done this work on behalf of the City of Phoenix, in which we will get a legal memorandum that outlines whether or not the county has standing to bring action against FAA and their analysis of the merits of doing so. I believe the price tag with respect to this is $7,500. As a former administrative lawyer, I promise you that is about as inexpensive as you can get for work of this nature. So I had recommended that the Quiet Skies Coalition pursue this, 
And they were the ones actually that reached out to the Denton's law firm. That's the particular law firm involved, Denton's, D-E-N-T-O-N-S. And it was this citizens coalition that picked up the phone, called them and said, could you provide this? And if so, for how much? So advised our county attorney. Our county attorney picked up the phone and confirmed that we could get such a memorandum for that price. And that comes close to a no brainer because this really is so intolerable. I think all of you are aware of basically what happened here. We had a situation that was aggravating for the region because it was spread out throughout the region, Northern Virginia, DC, Montgomery County. It was aggravating for many. And as a result of technology improvements, they have now made it intolerable for our residents because the flight paths are such, and you can see them visually. We have a copy of them here to the extent to which you haven't seen them, the presentations that show exactly where these planes are going. And the other day I stood in this person's front yard every 90 seconds, every 90 seconds, you could hear the airplanes and not just a little. And that starts as early as 5.30, 6 o'clock in the morning. Imagine trying to sell your home. Imagine trying to sleep. Imagine just trying to have a quality of life. It's not okay. So I continue to believe that we ought to pursue legal action against FAA and believe that this is a prudent next step in pursuing that course. Next item. On Friday, some of you may have seen an article in one of our local journals with respect to a very fine restaurant in Bethesda called Grapeseed that announced that it is going out of business. It's pulling up shop. Grapeseed, as some of you know, made its mark by pairing wines with fine food. So. I picked up the phone and called the owner on Friday and asked him about his experience with our Department of Liquor Control. Because when you sell a lot of wines, it matters what your experience is with DLC. We did not go into operational issues, which sometimes has been the focus of conversation. What we went into is the fact that the markup that DLC imposes which he estimated was 25 to 30 percent, basically came out of his bottom line because he could not raise his price to compensate for it. So it literally was coming out of his bottom line. He estimates that cost him approximately $100,000. And he said to me, if I had had that $100,000, I would have been able to renovate my restaurant. I would have been able to stay in Bethesda. Now, so I have a letter that I am sending him that basically confirms our conversation that I'll share with you, and you are welcome to call him because I wanted to make sure I did get it right in the course of our conversation. But to me, it is an example of why it is that our, the cost that is imposed by this unique monopoly Now, some people might say, gee, Roger, what do you care about a high-end restaurant? The reality is there are a lot of high-end restaurants that do not come to Montgomery County for precisely this reason, that they do not want to deal with the DLC, that they know their profit will be less than the District of Columbia or any place else in the universe. And they say to themselves, it's a hard market. You can't give up this piece of the profit and expect that you'll do as well as other restaurants. So why would we invest here as opposed to someplace else? And that's exactly what they do. That's why there are fine restaurants in DC. That's why there are fine restaurants in other parts of the region. So to me, this is sort of the, the canary in the mine shaft, if you will, saying, Houston, there's a problem here. So this doesn't speak to the delivery issues of not being able to get your beer delivered on New Year's Eve and things of that nature, which are also true and continue to be true. And we saw a theft recently that happens. 
But this to me is really the heart of the issue. It is how it takes away from the bottom line of our small businesses in Montgomery County. We also have on the agenda tomorrow something I'm real pleased about, which is an appropriation for Wall Park. It is in White Flint 1. This was one of the big public amenities that we promised our public. And what this appropriation will allow is building a garage that then will allow us to tear up the asphalt right around the Shriver Aquatic Center and turn it into a lovely park so we don't need it for a parking lot. We can use it as a park, but we needed to create a garage to substitute for those spaces. And these dollars will allow that and allow us to move forward with an important public amenity. And it's how we keep faith with our community of saying, okay, we promise the public amenity, we're delivering on the public amenity. And so it, that is such a fundamental part. We hear this in Bethesda as we go through the Bethesda plan a lot. Okay, what are the benefits that our existing community is going to derive from this redevelopment? And so this makes it real that we are making this happen for our community. Why don't I stop there? Turn it to you guys. What do you got? I'll tell you what I found shocking was that there was a requirement previously for physicians to have mandatory training with respect to opioids and that in the 2016 session that mandatory training was removed by law. I don't understand how at a moment in which our governor and our state legislature is so fixated, appropriately so, on addressing this crisis, how it was that we actually took a step backwards. And so we have asked our staff to find out what happened here and why, and how did the governor allow this to happen without vetoing it. So I don't know. I know that the AMA and others are always against mandatory anything. But when you have a crisis of this proportion, the notion that you don't want to make sure that every prescriber is aware of how dangerous these drugs can become to people, um, we're just sort of scratching our head. What we also learned, of course, is something we, we thought we knew before, which is our county as a county has no authority over this issue. Okay. We can't invoke our Board of Health to impose requirements on physicians. It is a state preempted set of issues and we need our state to be aggressive in making sure our public and those who prescribe are aware of the dangers. In terms of treatment for opioids, I know that in Baltimore, um, the mayor suggested that you don't want treatment centers near you, you want them somewhere else because there's an invitation of crime, you want them out of the area. What's the situation in Montgomery County, and do you have concerns about placement of tre treatment centers? I'm not as concerned about placement of treatment centers as I am making sure that we have enough beds, and that came up at the tail end of our conversation today, to make sure that that is something that we can do. We can help people with their addiction, and it's something, quite frankly, that our county has done for years and that we're proud of. But it is how many beds are needed and are we taking care of them was a question that was raised at the very end and something that is within our ability as budget makers to attend to. How are we doing on that score? What were they I, able to tell I, you? They, they were not able to tell us that because the focus really was not on the treatment per se, it was on trying to avoid treatment. On the bridge, um, are you at all concerned that the chairman of, of Montgomery's new economic development entity has been one of the most vociferous advocates of this crossing? I would say to you that I think Mr. Buchanan has made great contributions to our county and our county's economic development uh, future. And on this issue, he and I have a fundamental disagreement. 
but he's certainly entitled to his view. I don't think he is expressing his view in his official capacity as chair of our Economic Development Corporation. Um, he has long fought for this, um, and I have long had a different view. So life's complicated. So where is the energy for this coming from? Could you be a little more specific where you think the push for this is coming from? Well, certainly coming from Loudoun. It's certainly coming from people that have investments in that part of the world. Um, if I was a Pennsylvania real estate developer, I would be eager for this as well. I mean, this is the ultimate expression of sprawl, right? But even the statistics belie the need for this. Every analysis shows that the overwhelming majority of people that use 270 and use the American Legion Bridge are going either at the Beltway or within the Beltway. They're not going out to Dulles. So this is simply, it just makes no sense to me as to why we would focus on that when we have <coughs> real issues to deal with, with real solutions. So it, it just injects into a, con a conversation that is nothing but destructive and would just consume decades of time. I mean, if you think it took a long time for the ICC to be built, it would be built in a nanosecond compared to this bridge. So why spin your wheels on something that simply will not happen instead of being real and focusing on real solutions that would matter to people's quality of life? We can do that. That's what makes this such a ridiculous conversation. And I have to tell you, I, I went with one of my colleagues and a number of people and met with Secretary Pete Ron on this very issue maybe two years ago with members of the state legislature, myself, I think Mr. Leventhal was with me at the time, and we sat down with Pete Ron, and, and guess who else was at the table? BWI. Ask yourself whether or not BWI, which is a major economic engine of the state of Maryland, would find itself favorably disposed to a second crossing built by the state of Maryland to get to Dulles Airport. It will not happen. The ICC was built in large measure, not because of Montgomery County's needs, but because of BWI, of providing access to BWI for that corridor. And it has done so. So this is just not ever going to happen. Imagine taking this through our ag reserve. I don't think so. Is there something that immediately you think or quickly can be done at the American Legion Bridge to help that bottleneck, to resolve that? Immediately, quickly, no, but I'm sorry, you start doing that work. That's real. We know we got a problem there. We can add capacity. Will it be expensive? Absolutely. But the federal government does pick up the tab, and this is actually, in many people's judgment, a national security issue, right? American Legion Bridge is really important to the entire region. Imagine something happening in which people need to get out. Okay? If that bridge isn't functional, if that bridge isn't operating, it's terrible. And it's terrible every day. So you add capacity there. You add HOT lanes on 270, which we have been arguing for for years. And instead we get this you know, $100 million investment that'll, you know, make a modest improvement, okay? And then nothing, really? That does not do what needs to be done. And so we are gonna keep fighting for what really can make a difference, not for some fantasy zombie bridge that will never happen. When you refer to this bridge, what from point to point, is this the Point of Rocks location? Or? This is from, literally, they are now saying from the ICC to Dulles Airport. So 
They want to study it, going right through all of these communities. It's like, this was studied in the 70s, this was studied in the 80s, it was studied in the 90s, okay? We don't need to keep studying this issue. We need to get on with taking care of the things that we know we can do relatively easily. We have the capacity on 270 to have two reversible lanes, H-O-T, reversible lanes. We have the capacity to do that. We have the capacity all the way to the American Legion Bridge. Uh, on the uh, FAA uh, legal, I, what, how do you call it again? It's a legal memorandum. Legal memorandum? Yes. And, and what do you expect to be the outcome of this? In, in pursuing this memorandum, what do you hope FAA does when, when you say, when you hand this to them? or make them aware of it. So say, uh, we will not make the FAA aware of the legal memorandum. Okay. The, the legal memorandum is really, if you will, for our county attorney to assess whether or not we have a path forward to sue FAA. So before you take an action like that, you say to yourself, okay, give me the arguments for and against, or you know, can, I, can I make this stick? Because you don't want to do something that's futile. So you turn to people that have done this analysis previously, who have done it for cities who have sued FAA. I confess I am expecting a green light, not a red light with respect to this legal memorandum. But that remains to be seen. And then our county attorney then can go to our, our county executive and say, I think this makes sense. And again, this is just determining whether or not you have legal standing. In other words, legal whether you have the right to get into this I, arena. I, I, don't, right? I don't want to be that precise. That is one of the issues that okay. they will look at. Okay. And then they will assess the strengths and weaknesses of bringing such a case. I know that Governor Hogan has expressed concern similar to this in, uh, on the impact around BWI yes. from the same type of program of narrowing the path and noise, et cetera. H have you talked to him about that? And does this help your case if you were to go, hey, the folks at BWI are suffering just like our residents are because of what's going on at National and Dulles? And as I understand it, the governor has also weighed in on behalf of us in this issue as well. And I would say to you, again, we are not alone, not just BWI, Los Angeles, Denver, Phoenix, across the country. What had happened was they came up with a new technology that made it easier for them to shoot traffic down a very narrow path without doing the analysis of the impact on communities of doing so. You do a cost-benefit analysis. They did not do that. They did not go on the ground and measure. This is what these communities will experience and then determine whether or not this is fair to impose on communities. It was simply, we can do this. We have the technology to do this. We've been urged to do this. We're doing it. And so this law firm has already done work in Phoenix? Yes, has, has represented, I believe. filed against the FAN? Yes, by Phoenix. And do you know what the outcome of that is? I believe it's still, still pending. The technology that you're referring to, does that help them take a more direct route? It, it does. Okay. So they can be more precise, and they are being more precise. But again, it used to be scattered. Northern Virginia got its fair share. Now, actually, Northern Virginia is sitting real pretty. They're saying, thank you. And so the notion that we will get a, quote, regional solution by negotiating this, they couldn't get a regional solution at BWI even when they reached consensus, okay? In BWI's case, everybody came together, all the impacted communities, and they came forward with a suggestion. We'd be okay if FAA, you did this. And FAA said, thank you very much, no thank you. So I don't think we're going to get there, particularly in this context. A, I think it would be harder for us to get a regional consensus when part of the region has been spared and another been burdened. 
and I don't believe they've done what an administrative agency is supposed to do in assessing the impact of their actions. That's what leads you to a legal action. Thoughts on the delays on the red line today and all the issues of Metro smoke at Friendship Heights? Every day. So I didn't know, I actually looked at my phone because I get WMATA alerts. I looked at my phone today before coming up here going, anything I don't know, and there was no new alert. So you've got something a little more recent than I do. Um, I think you are aware of this, the water issues and Friendship Heights and, and uh, the medical center area and of WMATA's efforts to now address that in a significant way. Now, it will impose hardship on our riders when you do the kind of work that they contemplate doing, but it is the first time that they have said to themselves, ah, here's a solution that wouldn't be a tunnel within a tunnel, because that's what they had focused on previously, literally recreating a tunnel inside the tunnel because the water was coming in. And now they have this new mechanism or this new approach that apparently mining companies have used with some success, where they'll be drilling up into the ceiling and things of that nature. So our long term, we, we can have to continue to focus on the long term solutions. And this hopefully will be one so that we stop having arcing insulator fires. But as you can appreciate, water and electricity are not a good combination. So all your issues today have had a state component and the governor is in Silver Spring as we speak. Is there anything else you need to ask him besides planes, trains? In automobiles? <laughs> You're going the wrong way! Anyway, I love that movie. I only saw it about 15 times. <laughs> Every Thanksgiving. Um, in this moment, I don't have an answer for you. Okay. Um, there are a number of doctors who have county contracts, I would assume, through various services you provide. You contract with a doctor to provide homeless services, possibly. Could you not use that contract to insist on the doctor receiving opioid training? I don't believe we could. It's a fair question of leveraging a county contract. I'll, I'll pose it to our legal team to find out, and I don't know how many doctors that we do employ for that purpose are in the opioid prescription world. Mm -hmm. The people that we typically employ are treatment specialists, not prescription specialists. But it's, a, it's an interesting thought of how we could utilize our county power if we could. Do you have any thoughts on the um, uh, transition of old anglers into a country inn where people would stay overnight and there would be functions? I'm assuming as a restaurant they have functions now. Is, so what's the, what's the impact there? So when we did our zoning rewrite, which was a massive effort, this issue was not discussed at all as to the definition of country ends. And the relevance of this is not really country ends. It is that it allows, if you have a country inn, it allows for, quote, banquet facilities. So I think of country inns as sort of how you describe it, three or four rooms on top of a, of a place where somebody stays sort of like a and b, &B only quaint and lovely, not a 9,000 square foot banquet facility. And so I ultimately concluded that this was a loophole in the way in which w it was drafted that should not allow it there. And that we need to close that loophole because it's just not okay there. 
there are lots of places where country inns and banquet facilities can be. I don't consider Old Angler's Inn to be in the country. So I get that there are trees, but that does not make it the country. So that's why I have co-sponsored a zoning text amendment that would preclude this possibility because I do see it as closing a loophole that had we had that conversation at the time, understanding exactly where would this be allowed and where wouldn't it be allowed, I'd say, well, under no circumstances do I think it belongs in a suburban community. All right, gang? Thank you.